and then we'll get into the message. The federal parliament of Canada passed Bill C-4 with the support of all political parties and no opposition from any elected member of parliament. So this is something that passed without no opposition from the opposition. Normally, the uh, way our government works is we have the government on one side of parliament, and on the other side, we have the opposition. And uh, the opposition decided that they were not going to oppose the government on this. This bill, while purporting to protect individuals from coercion and abuse in the form of conversion therapy, that's the phrase that they use, will instead criminalize Christianity in our country. This bill's wording is sufficiently broad to allow for the criminal prosecution of Christians who would speak biblical truth into the lives of those in bondage to sexual sins such as homosexuality and transgenderism. Even a mother or father who offers their children freedom from sexual sin through repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ could be threatened with up to five years in, in jail. Our king and head, Jesus Christ, is greatly displeased with our MPs for their sinful disregard for the spiritual and eternal well-being of Canadians. But it is important to note that they have also committed high blasphemy in referring to biblical teachings in the bill as myths and stereotypes. We all must therefore tremble to consider what terrifying judgments will be visited upon our nation for this bold gesture of hatred toward the Most High God. See, I'm not afraid of what the government could possibly use this law to do against us. I'm afraid what God can do in response to this legislation, to our nation, to uh, our country. May the Bride of Christ commit herself to mourning, fasting, and crying out in solemn prayer for forgiveness for the sins and worldliness in churches across Canada that have led to this calamity. See, I don't believe it's the, the problem with Canada is that whatever the world is doing, the world will do what the world has always done. It is the church that has been holding back the world from going to the extremes. And when we allow worldliness into the church, the world can then proceed to go farther and farther into wickedness and worldliness. Bill C-4 became the law of the land on January 7th, 2022. The proposed changes, this bill proposes changes to the criminal code, by su and it's been summarized this way, quoting Bill C-4, this enactment amends the criminal code to, among other things, create the following offenses, causing another person to undergo conversion therapy, doing anything for the purpose of removing a child from Canada with the intention that the child undergo conversion therapy outside of Canada promoting or advertising conversion therapy, and receiving a financial or other material benefit from the provision of conversion therapy. It also amends the criminal code to authorize courts to order that advertisements or conversion therapy dis be disposed of or deleted. The problem that we have with this is not what it I just read. The problem is with the definition that they give for what does conversion therapy mean? Because when we think of conversion therapy, we think of the, you know, many years ago when they found out of a, someone who's homosexual, they would treat them with electroshock therapy and other things to try to get them to, uh, to change their sexual orientation. We don't believe in that either. Amen. We're against that kind of stuff. But when you broad brush conversion therapy uh, and let me tell you, give you the definition that is given in the bill. They say this, conversion therapy means a practice, treatment, or service designed to, number one, change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual. So notice it's not the other way around, but change it to heterosexual. Change a person's gender identity to cisgender. You say, what's cisgender? They're going to say the exact same thing in the next one change a person's gender expression so that it conforms to the sex assigned to the person at birth. So cisgender means that I am a born a male, and therefore my sexual orientation is to be heterosexual. That's what cisgender is. Uh, letter D, to repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior. To repress a person's non-cisgender gender identity or 
repress or reduce a person's gender expression that does not conform to the sex assigned to the person at birth. For greater certainty, this definition does not include a practice, treatment, or service that relates to the exploration or development of an integrated personal identity, such as a practice, treatment, or service that relates to a person's gender transition. In other words, it's okay to give conversion therapy so that they can go from heterosexual to homosexual, but it is not okay to give conversion therapy for homosexuals to go to heterosexuality. That's basically what they're saying. And that is not based on an assumption that a particular sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression is to be preferred over another. So as such, when you read these, it remains very unclear, and I hope you're just as confused as I am at some of the wording, but, and it, it should be because it's unclear to parents, to pastors, to counselors, to mentors, how these terms ought to be understood. Assurances by lawmakers have been provided to constituents that the bill only seeks to criminalize coercive efforts and coercive practices, treatments, and services, and that it would not apply to a person who sought out a pastor or a mentor for help to live a chaste sexual lifestyle or to live in an alignment with their biological sex. However, just because the lawmakers give us that, that assurance, no such assurances appear in the language of the actual bill. That's the problem. It's like... It's like Jason Kenney getting up in the, in the, in the uh, summer and saying, there is no way ever possibly that Alberta will ever have a vaccine passport system. And then two months later, turn around and change that. So just because the lawmakers say this is what the intention is, if the wording is not in the bill, then there's no reason why that bill cannot be applied further. It is not uncommon for Parliament to pass vague, vaguely worded legislation with the expectation that the specific application and limitation of the law will be determined by the courts. In the meantime, however, pastors, parents, counselors, mentors will be operating without any clear assurance that their good faith efforts to teach and command a biblical and historical uh, Christian perspective on sex and gender will proceed without legal interference. Many Christians are also concerned about the metaphysical bias that is clearly expressed in the preamble to the bill as passed. It reads as such. Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to the persons who are subjected to it, whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because, among other things, it is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender, gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over the sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions over others. So basically what they just said is that Bible truth is myths and stereotypes. It goes on to say, and whereas in light of those harms, it is important to discourage and denounce the provision of conversion therapy in order to protect the human dignity and equality of all Canadians. So it's really, really nicely written up to say something very, very, uh, what I believe, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Offensive. Offensive. It's, uh, for me, it's offensive for somebody to come up and say, your Bible is full of myths and stereotypes. Many legal esper- experts, Christians and otherwise, were surprised by the language adopted by C4. It does not appear to overreach, the, it does appear, I should say, to overreach the line established clearly in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, the preamble in the opening section of the charter reads this way. So this is the part of the Constitution, the highest law of the land. This is our our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It says this, Whereas Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. That's That's our Canadian Constitution. Canada was founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. And it goes on to say, guarantee of rights and freedoms. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in its subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. 
Fundamental freedoms. Everyone has the following fu fundamental freedoms. Freedom of conscience and religion. Freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press and other media of communication. Freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of association. In the Canadian legal system, the charter rights are considered supreme rights against which no law can be made. The charter identifies freedom of religion, freedom of thought, freedom of opinion, freedom of expression, and freedom of media communication as fundamental freedoms. Therefore, it is difficult to see how this law could be charged against a pastor for preaching on, let's say, Genesis 1.27 or Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23, how that would be able to stand considering the charter of rights. And if the teaching or expression is stated in terms of it being a tenet of religious belief, it would appear to be protected by the Charter of Rights. The problem is, as we saw with our freedoms already in the last two years being stripped away, is that, and the reason they, they were, are getting away with it is because the Charter does stipulate that all these fundamental freedoms are subject to, notice the phrase, reasonable limits prescribed by law, that can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. The good thing about that is we are no longer a free and democratic society, therefore they can no longer be demonstrably justified. But it will be the responsibility of the court, basically, to determine how precisely to balance the freedom of the parent or pastor to teach and command biblical sexual ethics and identity with the freedom of the individual to pursue a life of sexual liberty. Many legal experts expect the language and the reach of the bill to be eventually curtailed and uh, brought out into courts and so on. So that is the Bill C-4 that came into effect uh, this last week. Our response as a church is this. This past week marked a monumental change in Canadian law and society with the enactment of the federal Bill C-4, which amends the criminal code. The law's stated purpose is to outlaw conversion therapy, and we as a church strongly oppose the coercive and unscientific therapeutic practices that the bill was introduced to address. We appreciate and affirm the desire of parliamentarians to protect the vulnerable. However, we are deeply concerned that the effective reach of the legislation could be extended far beyond its stated purpose because its definition of conversion therapy is vague. Many are concerned that it could capture parents, pastors, and counselors who teach a biblical understanding of sexuality in a variety of situations. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees our freedom of religion, conscience, thought, belief, expression, and association. It is our prayer that the law will be applied and clarified as needed in such a way as to honor these charter practices and protections. We recognize that the greatest danger facing the Christian church today is not that we might face criminal persecution or prosecution, but rather that we might compromise in our teaching of the Word of God or fall silent in our proclamation of the gospel for fear of being locked up. That's our biggest fear. Along with churches of like conviction across Canada, we, Mountain View Baptist Church, stand today to pledge that we are committed to obeying God above all others. As Peter said to the Sanhedrin, shall we obey man rather than God? With the Lord's help, we will continue to proclaim the whole counsel of God's word, not just the ones that are, uh, what do we call, politically correct. Without fear and without favor. This includes God's life-giving design for human beings, created in His image, male and female, with sexual intimacy reserved for the con covenantal union of marriage between one man and one woman. We will continue to issue the call to repent of all kinds of sin and to believe the gospel, knowing that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. And that salvation through Jesus Christ is the one true hope for our world. Amen. We will continue to love and to serve all people in our communities without distinction in Jesus' name. I don't care if you're vaccinated, unvaccinated, don't care if you're homosexual or straight, we will love you and serve you as a church and we will give you the gospel because everyone needs it. As we press on in the ministry, we will trust our Heavenly Father to guard us and to keep us 
and to work out His greater purposes for our good and for His glory. We continue to pray for our government and to plead with the Lord to have mercy on this needy, wicked, pagan, heathen land. Amen. That being said, we're going to preach a message tonight on biblical sexuality and marriage. Very short, very simple, because the Bible has a lot to say, but it's, a lot of it's repetitive. And so we're going to, I got three points for you tonight. Number one, sexuality comes from God. Sexuality is not something bad. It is not evil. Uh, it is not something to be ashamed of. I know it has become for many places, you go to, if you, for example, apply for a work or you're in sales, they always tell you there are three subjects you never talk about. What are the three subjects you never talk about? Religion, politics, sexuality. Never talk about those three things. Why? Because they are so controversial these days. But we have to understand sexuality is something that God has given us. It is a gift. God created gender, right? God created gender. In fact, let's go to our verse, Genesis 1, 27. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Let's do verse 26 too, just to give it a little bit more context. Verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth for every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So those are genders, by the way. Male and female, right? We would call those genders. God created sexuality. God created gender. God intended for men and women to complement one another and to take pleasure in one another. God has provided for the full and glad expression of this sexual intimacy within the confines of a beautiful institution that he made, and that is the confines of marriage. God wants all of us to be able to enjoy sex, but within the context of marriage. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 11 and 12. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so the man also by the woman, but all things of God. What did God say when he created Eve? It is not good that man should be alone. Now, there are... A lot of guys out there who decide, you know, I wanna, don't want to get married. It's just me and my dog. God tried that with Adam, and it didn't work. Because, you know, the age-old saying, the dog is man's best friend. It's absolutely untrue. It's unbiblical. Now, a dog is a very good friend, but he's not man's best friend. Let me prove it to you. I'll give you point number two, uh, but let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Verses 18 through 22. Genesis chapter 2, 18 through 22. If you're already in Genesis 1, it should be easy to find. Now, I want you, I want you to see this. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. And out of the ground, notice this, out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl there and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called Every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now, that means that even the dog was formed out of the ground and, and brought before Adam. And God said, what are you going to call this guy? And Adam said, well, I'm going to call him Jeff. And said, God said, okay, Jeff is his name. You guys are not laughing. This is supposed to be interactive and funny, okay? <laughs> but I, I want you to realize, what was the reason for God bringing all these animals before Adam? Notice the next verse. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an helpmeet for him. In other words, all these animals that God brought before Adam, none of them were compatible with Adam, including the dog. None of them were compatible. See, the whole reason was for Adam to have a companion. It is not good that man should be alone. So he brought all these animals, formed them, 
God, Adam gave him a name, but they still weren't man's best friend. And so what did God do? The Bible says, Then the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man, man's best friend. So sexuality comes from God. He created genders. He created man and woman. And uh, we'll go on to see point number two. Sexual activity is to be reserved for marriage only. Sexual activity is to be reserved for marriage only. Same text, Genesis chapter 2. Look with me, continuing on in verses uh, 23 and 24. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Sexual activity is ordained of God, and God commanded it. Um, when God created man and uh, Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 1, we see that he, t he gave them a commandment. He said, in uh, verse 28, God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. How do you be fruitful and multiply without sexual activity? You don't. So God commanded them to have sexual activity within the confines of marriage. Now, our world has decided that, well, Yes, it's true that sex should be reserved for marriage, but we still like our homosexual activity. So what we're going to do is we're going to legalize same-sex marriage, and then we are biblical, right? That's what the world thought it would be a good idea. Let's legalize same-sex marriage, and, and then uh, we, we don't have to worry about feeling guilty because we're uh, active, sexually active outside of marriage. We are within the confines of marriage. Well, the Bible teaches very clearly that marriage is defined by God as a union, a physical union, and a spiritual union, and a civil union between one man and one woman. Amen? Yeah. Now, we do see examples of one man and multiple women in the, in the Scripture, but we ne never see in the Scripture that God blesses that or that God's approval on that. Right? God uses it, and God uses bad decisions all the time, but God never approved. So even though Jacob had four wives, even though Abraham, uh, Sarah said, take Hagar, even though, um, what's her name, Samuel's mom? I'm forgetting now. <laughs> Hannah. Even though Hannah had a sister wife, did you notice in all these all these. Uh, relationships where there are multiple wives and one man, it, there's always family trouble. Do you notice that? Always. Always family trouble. Because it's not supposed to work that way. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. Ma Matthew 19, 4 through 6. This is Jesus expounding on Genesis. The Bible says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the begin beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. So, not only did God define marriage in the Old Testament, Jesus reaffirmed it in the New Testament. He made them male and female, and it says that he, the man is to leave his father and mother and to cleave to his wife, and the two bodies shall become one body, one flesh. Therefore, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God has brought together, let no man divide or put asunder. In other words, God hates divorce as well. The whole issue in Matthew chapter 19 that Jesus is discussing is they came and asked him, is it lawful that a man could put away his wife? And and Jesus knew about the, the commandment that Moses gave. And so he asked, well, what did Moses say? Well, Moses said we could if she fornicates. 
And then Jesus says, well, Moses gave that because of the hardness of your hearts, because it wasn't like that from the beginning. The beginning was one man, one woman become one flesh for life. And that's the way God intended it to be. But because of the hardness of our hearts, we have changed God's plan. And every time we change God's plan, it never works out. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you make way there, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Sexual activity is reserved for marriage only. Marriage as defined by God in the Bible is one man, one woman. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own... Is that singular or plural? That's singular, right? His own wife, not his own wives, right? How many of you ladies here would appreciate your husband to have one wife, your own wife, and that's it, right? Anybody here say, yeah, I don't mind sharing my husband with other women? I didn't think so. Why? Because it's not natural, it's not biblical, it leads to a lot of confusion, it leads to a lot of problems. Let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own, singular or plural? Husband. That's singular, right? How many of you men would like to share your wife? Anybody? I didn't think so. So sexual activity is to be reserved for marriage alone, and marriage as defined by God is one woman, one man, become one flesh for life. It goes on, let the husband render to, unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. That word, to render unto the wife due benevolence, what that means is you are supposed to be sexually active. That's what God intends. A part of marriage, what helps keep the marriage together is sexual activity. And it's not something to be ashamed of, and it's not something we need to hide around and blush about. God commands that married couples regularly enjoy sexual intimacy. Notice verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, and the only reason that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And then after fasting and prayer, he says, come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. In other words, do not stop engaging in sexual activity with your spouse because Satan will tempt you. And the only time you are to stop is for a little season so that you can give yourselves fully to fasting and prayer. Why would he say fasting and prayer? Well, when we fast, what are we doing? We're not just not eating, right? What we're doing is we're giving up on what our body wants so that we can focus on what our spirit needs. Usually we think of fasting as prayer, as uh, giving up food. And yes, that's a big part of it, but it could also mean giving up sexual activity for a while so that you are giving yourself up to a more spiritual need, prayer and fasting, but only for a short season, the Bible says. Go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. The reason I say let's not be ashamed of it and let's not blush about it, there's no guilt about it if it is in the right context. Because Hebrews 13, verse 4, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So marriage is honorable. It is good. It is pure. It is honorable. The bed is undefiled as long as they, it stays within the context of marriage. There is no guilt. There is no sin. It is absolutely blessed by God. Amen? The moment we feel guilty is when we take it outside of that context. When we go on the internet and view pornography when we go flirting with women or men that are, that are not our spouses, when we go doing things and seeking that physical 
pleasure elsewhere. That's when it becomes unbiblical. That's when it becomes a perversion of God's gift of sex. That's when it becomes something that is not honorable. When we redefine marriage, it no longer is honorable. Amen? It might be legal, and we're not going to, you know, scream at people who we find out are homosexual. We're not going to say, oh, you're a dumb sinner. You're going to go to hell, and, and you're going to burn forever if you don't repent. That's not the way to treat homosexuals, by the way. We want to lovingly share the gospel and lovingly uh, share the love of Christ because you're not going to attract them to Christ with hatred. And you're not going to attract them to Christ with, with belittling them and, and criticizing them. But we are going to speak the truth in love. And we're not going to shy away from speaking the truth in love, no matter what the law says. Point number three, perversions of sexuality. This is what might land me in jail, but that's okay. With perverting sexuality. Our world is obsessed with perverting sexuality. Our world seems to find their identity in who they sleep with. The world today promotes every kind of sexual perversion under the sun and mocks biblical marriage and purity. Let me list a few perversions of sexuality listed in the scripture. Adultery is number one. Adultery. That means that you are a married person engaging in sexual intimacy with someone else other than your spouse. That's what adultery is. Exodus 20 verse 14 says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Right. Hebrews 13 verse 4, we just read it, Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Another perversion of sexuality is lust or pornography or looking at someone else other than your spouse with bad intentions. Matthew verse 5 or chapter 5 verse 28, Jesus said, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery in, with her already in his heart. You should read up on some of the statistics on pornography. It is frightening. Three in every ten men in churches all across our nation are actively engaging pornography. That means if I got ten of us men to stand up, there would be three of us that are actively involved in pornography somehow. And that's within the church. That's not in the world. In the world, it's probably a lot higher. Within the church, three out of ten. You need to stay away from that kind of stuff. It will, it will, it will mess up your mind so much that you will come to the bedroom to your wife or your husband with unrealistic expectations. And it will destroy your marriage. Do not view that filth. I think it was King David who said in Psalm 100 or Psalm 101, I can't remember which one, but he said, I will put no evil thing before mine eyes. That is a commitment that you and I need to make. Not just men, by the way. Pornography is something that a lot of women are engaging in and also viewing online. Adultery, lust, the next one, prostitution. Desperate times call for desperate measures, right? I heard a statistic not too long ago about uh, a lot of these oil and gas families that have been in the business and that, that, that whole industry is just collapsing right now. I think downtown, which used to be full of oil and gas businesses, uh, the business um, property uh, vacancy is up to about 33% right now, the highest it's ever, it's ever been. Just 10 years ago, the vacancy in downtown Calgary was 2%. And most of it was oil and gas companies. And I heard how all these oil and gas workers had all this big income. So what do they do? They go and buy the million-dollar houses in Calgary. And then the, their company lets them off because they can't, they're no longer able to survive in this, in this uh, liberal atmosphere. And so what happens is they're very tempted 
those wives are tempted to either engage in prostitution just so that they can keep the mortgage going or to go on to some pornography uh, website and, and videos and do one-on-one -on -one services for people. It is awful. Not that they want to do it, but they feel they have to just to survive. There's a reason Leviticus 19 verse 29 says, Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall into whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. Do you notice one of the things that leads to the land being full of whoredom and wickedness is when we allow our daughters and our wives to go into prostitution. A man who is in charge of multiple prostitutes, often known as a pimp, he handles all the money. He handles all the cash. He just gets, sends the girls out and makes sure that they're taken care of and makes sure they're paid enough uh, to survive, but not enough to get out. Right? That's one of the major contributors to where we are as a society right now and, and all that's being promoted in our society sexually. Prostitution. Whether it's prostitution via pornography or via actually getting money for selling your body to someone. It is a perversion of sexuality. Another perversion of sexuality is homosexuality. Also known as, if depending on your gender, lesbianism or so on. Romans chapter 1. In our, in our next text, Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, the Bible says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat." The Bible says God gave them up unto vile affections because of homosexual activity. When men give up the natural use of the woman. The Bible says women changed the natural use into that which is against nature. Men left the natural use of the woman. In other words, what he's saying is heterosexuality, what doesn't matter what the government says, is not a myth. It is the superior, it is the natural gender and natural um, sexual orientation. It is, let's use a different word that kind of simultaneous with natural. It is scientific. Yeah. Amen? Right. When you, uh, we were just talking about before the church, before church started, if only politicians would take a biology class. Biology tells us that if you want to be able to have a reproducing organism, you need a male and a female. It needs to reproduce. Even flowers are male and female and they have to reproduce. Everything on this planet that has life in them is male and female reproducing. Even the chicken needs the rooster to fertilize the egg. Everything, male and female. What happens when we change that? We no longer reproduce. We go extinct. The Bill C-4 said that Conversion therapy is, will harm our society. Let me tell you what's harming our society. It is the promotion and the activism of homosexual LGBTQ2+, and all the other acronyms they have added on to that. I think there's like 23 now. That's what's ruining our society. The destruction of the family unit, the destruction of marriages as God defined it. That's what's destroying our society. And we need to stand up for what is right. We need to stand up and boldly proclaim the truth and His Word and what He has commanded. Leviticus 18.22 Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. I can just hear Justin Trudeau. Excuse me. We like to use the word people kind, not necessarily mankind, womankind. Right? That anti-science, misogynistic, narcissistic leader of the Liberal Party. 
Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Anytime you see the word abomination in the Bible, think of the opposite of holy, holy, holy. God hates it. God hates it. God hates it. That's what I think. When I think of the word abomination, I think hate, hate, hate. God hates homosexuality. He doesn't hate homosexuals, but he hates homosexuality. God loved the world so much that he gave his son to die on the cross so that anybody who would receive him would be saved, including homosexuals. And we'll see that actually happen in the Bible. And it even happens today. Another perversion of sex is bestiality. Bestiality. Exodus twenty two nineteen. Whosoever lieth with a beast shall surely be put to death. I think I actually heard of somebody marrying his dog four or five years ago. I can't remember. It was on the news somewhere. And then an all-encompassing word that the Bible uses to describe all sexual perversions is the word fornication. The word fornication comes from the Greek word pornosia, where we get our English word pornography from, or pornicious. Anything that is a perversion of sexuality can be categorized as fornication. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, flee fornication. Every sin that man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. The very next verse, know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Ye are not your own. You were bought with a price. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Abstain from fornication. You said, you mean that out of all the billions of planets that God created, He is most concerned with who I sleep with? Yes, that's what I mean. I mean... Out of all the things and all the things that he's created, this vast universe, all the stars and planets, he, even, that, even though that is grand and huge and humongous, God still cares about the little things that you do when no one's looking. See, God's after your heart, and these perversions of sexuality will take your heart away from God. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, I will read it again. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, I'll give a stern warning. God will punish those who live in sexual perversion. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. I need you to turn there because we'll revisit it. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, that would be homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. If people do not turn from their sin, they will end up in hell. The problem with the LGBTQ plus community is their whole identity is wrapped up in their sexuality. That's the problem. It's gay pride. You take their pride away, take their identity away, and they have nothing. You and myself, our identity should not be tied in who we sleep with or what we do for a living. Or even whether we're evangelical or Baptist or Christian or not Christian, our identity should be wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. I am the Son of God, saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And because I am that, I want to do my very best to do everything in my life that will be pleasing unto Him. Revelation 21, verse 8 says, The fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God will punish those who live in sexual perversion and those who do not forsake it to come to Christ. 
But the good news is God will save and cleanse you from your sexual perversion if you do come to Christ. Again, 1 Corinthians 6. We'll begin in verse 9. We'll go all the way to verse 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. By the way, didn't Justin Trudeau, doesn't he always boast that he's a feminist? Nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionals shall inherit the kingdom of God. Notice this next phrase. And such were some of you. Did you get that? Such were some of you. In other words, the people that he's writing to in Thessalonica, or in Corinth, I should say, the people that Paul's writing to in Corinth, some of them were fornicators, some of them were idolaters, some of them were adulterers, some were effeminate, some were homosexuals. But God saved all of them. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. You were like this. But God saved you, God washed you, God sanctified you, God justified you. You no longer are in bondage to that. You are now the servant of the living God. That gives us hope because if we keep preaching the gospel, we actually might see some of these homosexuals come to the Lord Jesus Christ. If we do it in love, amen, gentleness and meekness. Let's not shy away because some new law came into effect. Let's stand up for what is right, stand up for what is true. We need to stand up against the major issues of our day. Abortion. Our nation is killing our own babies by the millions, and you wonder why we have Trudeau in office. Our nation is pushing this agenda for homosexuals and LGBTQ and now anti-conversion therapy, and we cannot preach truth into the lives of those that we love and want to see them go to heaven. And it's all going in one direction, evil, evil, evil. What did Genesis say? That the heart of man always going continu- or continually to evil. We are in that same society today. Man's heart continually directed towards evil, more and more evil. The only thing that will change that is if we have the boldness and the courage to stand up and declare the truth of the gospel. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. What's that song? How does it go? We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. We need to preach the gospel. That's what's going to cure our land. Not, not a conservative government, not bringing in politicians, not any of those things, uh, not social programs. We need to preach the gospel. We need to spread it far and wide. Get the, get the news out that Jesus saves. You say, well, I'm a homosexual. It doesn't matter. Jesus can save you. I'm a transgender. It doesn't matter. God, Jesus can save you. I don't care. I'm an atheist. Jesus can save atheists too. Jesus will save anybody if they're just willing to open their minds to the truth of the gospel. Because the truth shall make you free. Amen. May we be bold and courageous to, to proclaim the truth of God's word and to speak truth into the hearts and lives of those that we love and our co-workers and so on. And may we never shy away when God gives an opportunity to share the gospel, even if it might mean we're not politically correct and we might even go to jail for practicing our charter freedom-protected rights. Amen? God gave us sex, but He gave it within the confines of marriage. One man, one woman... And if we mess with that, we are being very detrimental to our society. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word, for your truth. Thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for his love towards us, towards all of us. Lord, uh, we see in the scripture how you saved all kinds of different sinners. You saved people like us. Lord, second generation Christians, first generation Christians, third generation. Lord, we understand that no sin is, is too big for you to wash away. And no sinner is too far gone for you to save. But I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be bold and courageous in our witness and in our stand for truth, that you might be glorified in our lives, in our witnessing, in our day-to-day interactions with people. May you be glorified and honored in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.